chapter six talks about juries. So <clears throat> states provide similar guarantees in regards to a right to a trial by jury as the federal system does, but this doesn't necessarily apply to all criminal prosecutions. So for example, the Supreme Court has consistently ruled that petty offenses do not um, require us to provide a jury trial. States were not bound by the Sixth Amendment jury guarantee until 1968, so um, all of your federal rights, most of them have incorporated onto the states, but not all of them have, and some of them haven't been incorporated until, you know, sometime in the last 50 to 100 years. And usually that comes about as a result of a Supreme Court case. So your Sixth Amendment rights, which is a right to a trial by jury, is not really guaranteed to the states until 1968 in the case of Duncan v. Louisiana. Now, just because you are guaranteed a right to a trial by jury does not mean you have to have one. Uh, you, as the defendant, can waive your right to a trial by jury and instead choose to have a bench trial. Or, of course, you can always plea out. So the Sixth Amendment tells us that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy trial and a public trial. And this is done by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. So we're generally tried in the community in which we committed the offense. And this jury trial is one of our essential rights here and a prerequisite of a free society. Jurors like judges are supposed to be impartial. So the role of a juror is to hear the facts of a case. And they're the ones who decide what facts to believe or what facts they believe are actually true. Uh, and then they can only base someone's guilt or innocence on those facts. So they're not supposed to take into account anything they've heard on the news, um, only the material that's been submitted into the trial. Jury's decisions or history, however, have caused some people to question whether or not the jury system um, has much integrity. The jury is supposed to act as the conscience of the community, and this is why, that, why we have somebody tried in the community in which they committed the crime. And they're meant to be a safeguard against biased judges or overzealous prosecutors. The jury is also the defendant's main protection uh, against any prejudice. And the jury is supposed to, of course, be protecting the defendant's uh, life and liberty. Ancient Greeks were the first to use members of the community uh, as jurors to pass judgment on people. Uh, and the ancient Romans also relied on an early form of the jury. Under English common law, juries had a dual function. They're responsible for investigating crimes as well as conducting trials of accused persons. So we still have a similar function today. Grand juries serve um, to investigate crimes. And the development of the grand jury dates back, you know, several hundred years. So a seize of Clarendon in 1166 stated the duties of the earliest versions of the grand jury. And a seize is essentially a binding order by the king. And this binding order ordered that 12 out of every 100 family heads were placed under oath and to, their job was to report crimes. The petite jury, which is what we think of as a regular jury today, develops in 1215 during the Fourth Lateran Council. Um, the, truth, the church at this point withdraws its support for trial by ordeal. So trial by ordeal is when people would fight um, or sometimes... You know, they would throw people in the water to see if they would sink or drown. Sorry, to see if they would sink or survive. And then in 1215, King John was also forced to sign the Magna Carta, and this reduced the king's power. So this document then provided the foundations for provisions of due process and jury trial. So why do we select a jury? Well, first we have a veneer, and that's a list of people who are qualified to serve as jurors. Its makeup has changed dramatically over time, and every state and jurisdiction does this differently. In medieval England, jurors were selected by the king, and they were selected from amongst wealthy landowners. So, you know, if we're using that as the basis for, for just gathering even our potential jurors, we're really limiting the number of people who are eligible to serve on juries. Historically in the U.S., a lot of jurisdictions did not allow women to be included, and as recently as 1966, three states still did not permit women to serve on juries. In other jurisdictions, if women wanted to be eligible for jury duty, they had to actually go down and physically ask to be placed on a list for jury duty, um, as opposed to the state just sort of automatically adding them. And this process is known as affirmative registration. 
So in order to become a juror, there's a relatively short questionnaire. Uh, the requirements you need to meet, you need to be a U.S. citizen, be at least 18, you cannot have any mental or physical disabilities, um, and you cannot have been convicted of a felony. So what happens next if you've been called for jury duty is you're going to go in and you're going to go through the process of voir dire. And this is the process by which the judge and the attorneys determine whether or not someone is appropriate to serve as a juror. So it's also an opportunity to learn about these existing prejudices of prospective jurors. And voir dire literally means to speak the truth. So what's happening here is attorneys want to attempt to uncover any biases you may have, um, any biases, especially in particular, that could prevent a fair trial. So they want to know, do you have any knowledge of the prior case? Have you already made up your mind? Um, they might want to know what are your attitudes towards particular issues re related to the case and whether or not you understand certain laws and statutes. So there's two methods by which we eliminate a jury. We don't actually pick a jury. It's more that we eliminate people from the jury. We have challenges for cause and we have peremptory challenges. So a challenge for cause doesn't, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, these are not limited. Basically here you're saying that there is a just reason for removing this person from the jury. They have a bias or they don't meet the requirements. And each side has an unlimited number of challenges for cause. Peremptory challenges, however, are basically ways that you strike someone off the jury that you think won't be sympathetic to your case, okay? You don't have to explain why you're striking this juror, and the number of peremptory challenges varies according to the case, um, and it varies according to jurisdiction. You are not, however, allowed to use these peremptory challenges to basically strike all the black people or all the Asian people or all of a particular group of people off a jury, Although proving that's what someone has done with their peremptory challenges is pretty difficult. Some other things that happen with juries, there's a television show on right now called Bull, and this is about jury consultants uh, and scientific jury selection. So in some really high profile cases, especially if the defendant has a lot of money, they may hire a jury consultant. Um, jury consultants are using science and data and research to determine what types of people are um, you know, would best benefit their case as a juror. Um, but there's still a lot of skepticism about this. Um, some people think that this is, you know, akin to jury tampering um, or that it threatens the integrity of the jury system. So generally the traditional size of a jury is 12, but there's no reason for that. It's really more of a historical tradition. Um, and throughout most of the last several centuries, juries have consisted of 12 people. You can have a jury of six. Massachusetts runs juries of six, um, a lot of times with juvenile offenders. Um, and in 1970, the Supreme Court said a 12-member jury is not a constitutional requirement. However, usually once we get um, down to a lower number of people, uh, the requirement for um, a unanimous decision might, ex might exist. However, with 12 members, we do not need to have a unanimous decision either. So sometimes during um, a jury case, and if you're familiar at all with the O.J. Simpson trial, um, the jury is sequestered. Um, we want to keep them away from any influences of the press. And this is a way that we can protect jurors from hearing about any other information that they shouldn't actually be hearing and taking into consideration. Um, this can be good and bad. It's certainly expensive. Um, I believe the O.J. jury was sequestered for nine months. It could foster bonding amongst them, which could help deliberations, or it could really get people feeling uh, kind of animus towards each other. It's really hard for us to study jury deliberations because jury decision making is private. Um, so what people do, and in particular what jury consultants do, is they'll run mock juries or mock trials in order to figure out, um, you know, how juries are making their decisions. Research so far tells us that juror decisions are affected by the quality and quantity of the evidence, uh, which certainly makes sense, uh, how credible a victim is, and stereotypes about crime. Personal characteristics of jurors, however, you know, whether they're a woman, whether they're a man, whether they're married, whether they have kids, don't actually predict their verdicts very well. 
Now, juries can also do this unique thing where they can choose to do what's called nullify the law. And this is probably what happened in the O.J. Simpson trial. So a jury can decide, even if the state has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt, they can decide to acquit somebody, right? This is, means the jury is ignoring or nullifying the law. And they have the authority to do this. However, no one is going to tell them they have the authority to do this. So someone on the jury needs to know this already. Sometimes we have what's called juror misconduct, and this could be either something as simple as lying in order to get out of jury duty, um, or it could be, and more commonly, it's engaging in improper or prohibited behavior while serving as a juror. So accepting a bribe, discussing the case before you're allowed to discuss it, um, maybe you've been told not to read any media coverage and you're reading that anyway. And that wraps up chapter six.